Actually, what time is it that people have on their official watches? Where, you know, how my watch compares to watches here in Hong Kong. What time, what time do people think it is? People think it is yet 10.30. Okay, so one possibility is that clock is right. Okay, we could declare that clock to be right. Does everybody agree that clock is right? Yes. Okay, so anybody who's not here is officially late by that watch clock. Okay, let's start off. Um, first question is, um, let's, okay, so let's, let's start off. First of all, are there any questions? Let's start out from um, what happened last class, okay? First, any questions about the policies of the class? How the uh, uh, homeworks work, what you're supposed to do in here, how things are being graded, anything like that. Okay? The, I guess the, what we needed for this class, what I wanted everybody to do is to come in with um, problems, the problems printouts themselves, or some access to the problem text. Okay? How many people have, pro how, have I don't know, how many people have the book? Okay? Okay, zero. Okay, so um, so this is I. I was thinking about this over the uh, over the, the the night. And again, I encourage you somehow. When I write the book, I think it's I, I I think I put things in there that I like people to read. That's one thing. Okay, that's one reason why I like people to to read the book. The other is to make part of it. The minimum amount is to make sure you have access to the problems. But the other thing is that when it comes to the theoretical material here, okay. Um, make sure that you, if you're having trouble understanding the theoretical material in the absence of the book, okay, that may also be a moral that the book is actually a useful thing. At this point, we don't yet have any theoretical material, okay? But when we talk about things like, uh, although I, I, I still think that, 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 that it's useful to read, um, you know, so I'm, I'm reluctant to say people shouldn't look at the book at all, okay, but figure out a way to get access and take a look and decide if this really has something to offer you. Okay? I don't, okay, any questions about the book? Okay, how many of you have to buy books for any of your classes? Raise your hand if you have to buy books for any of your classes. How many of you don't have to buy books for any of your classes? Okay? So this is, again, a very alien experience in the United States. Okay? But, um... But I encourage you to, uh, to, to make sure you tr try to read it, try to get what you can from it. That's all that the lesson. I'm not really trying to sell books here in the sense that, uh, rest assured that I get vanishingly small amounts of money from each one. If all of you go and buy my book, I can go out to dinner that night, but nothing more than that, okay? And even at the crummy local restaurant, okay? But it's a question I think that it is useful for people to read and to see. Any questions? But so long as you have access to the problems, that's, let's say, the minimum requirement, okay? Any questions? So how many people did bring their problems? Raise your hands again. And how many people didn't bring their problems? Okay? Get your, bring, you have to bring your problems, because we have to be able to study them, and you have to be able to, start to, to read them during the class. Any questions? Okay, what about people's experience in using the judges? Let's take a look at this now. Who, first of all, was able to successfully get an account on the UVA judge? Raise your hands if you successfully got an account on the UVA judge. Okay. Raise a hand if you did not successfully get an account on the UVA judge. That's everybody who didn't raise their hand before. I, I didn't try. I just Okay, you didn't try it, and that's why you failed. Okay, that's understandable. What about you? Did you try to get an account on the UVA judge, or...? And what happens when you did? I just, I just registered. You also just registered? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if you tell me that you haven't tried yet, that's an excuse that I can accept. But of course, for next class, you have to try. Okay? So, but presumably, judging by everybody's success, they're able to get an account on the UVA judge. How many people successfully got an account on the Programming Challenges judge? Raise your hand. How many people did not successfully get an account on the Programming Challenges Judge? Raise your hand. Okay. Did you all? Okay, good. Okay, I need, I need, need to know answers when I raise the question. Okay, so um, people were capable of doing it. I was having trouble here. You're saying that the trouble I was having with Programming Challenges, you say it doesn't work right with Firefox. Okay. How many people use Firefox as their preferred browser? 
Okay, did any of you have trouble with programming challenges in Firefox? How many people successfully use programming challenges in Firefox? Okay, so um, there is something weird at the very least about Firefox here. Okay, that's at the very least seems to be a problem. Yes, what's the question? Uh, there is a version problem for Firefox 2. It was not successful to use a programming, uh, programming challenge uh, just uh, judge. But if your version is uh, Firefox 3, it will be no problem. I think because uh, uh, I tried, I can use it in school, which all the versions are two, Firefox 2. But my own computer, I use Firefox 3, but I can successfully use the judge. Okay, so the answer is, if it's Firefox 3, everything is fine. Okay? Does anybody, does anybody have any comments about that? That suggests that maybe you should try to use Firefox 3. Mail, mail me information about that. Tell me what the problem is, and I'll forward that to Miguel, okay, who runs this thing, and see if there's a reason why we shouldn't be running on Firefox 2. But that's an interesting question. Any questions? Okay, so everybody successfully who tried got an account. How many people tried to submit a program to the programming challenges judge. Okay, good. How many people um, were, how many people, oh wait, so, so how many people successfully got the programming challenges judge to accept the problem? Okay, good. How many people tried to get programming challenges to accept the problem, but it didn't accept the problem? Raise your hand. Okay, so let's think now, now we're having one problem here where there's somebody said they, they got a problem that works correctly, on, that, but was judged accepted in the UVA judge, but not accepted in the programming challenge judge. Which problem was that? It was not one of the ones from this week, was it? Uh, not, not, in, not this week. Okay, so this week, let's deal with this week's problems for now. Okay? Any questions? Okay. How many people successfully got the programming, the UVA judge to, to, to a problem, su submitted a problem to the UVA judge successfully? Okay. How many people failed who tried? Okay. Nobody. The thing that's important to me is over, the, over this class period, by next class period, I want to make sure that we have the mechanics of how we do the submissions. Okay. And that everybody can sort of feel comfortable Doing, doing this kind of thing. So any questions now about, let's say, experiences, weird experiences you had with a judge? Okay? Uh, how many people found working with a judge was a good experience? Raise your hand if it was a good experience. Okay, I see two people. How many people felt it was a bad experience? Okay, two people. Why was it a bad experience? I think I this minesweeper for, uh, for maybe two or three hours Okay, so now that okay, so that's an interesting experience. What's your what's what's your frustration? Okay, okay, so 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 the question now is let's now go through the problems and try to figure out why there are pro okay so why the okay what what to do in these cases? Okay, so the concern here is I work very hard on this problem. I think it's right. The judge doesn't think so. Okay, now um. One first question is, did you try both judges? No, I haven't tried the UVA. Okay, did you try both judges? No, I tried the Okay, so what I would say is, my first reaction when something, you know, um, you know, they're saying that if something doesn't work, you get a, you know, you, you, first up you get a bigger hammer to hit it with, okay? I would say one source of frustration, if you think that your program is right, and UVA doesn't, and Program Challenge doesn't accept it, try the UVA judge, okay? Sometimes the software for these things is a little bit different, okay? And that will avoid some potential problems, okay? So you're claiming, look at me, I did a lot of these problems. Bridges was something from far ahead, right? But the problem that, the problem that, 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 that you had work on Programming Challenge, on UVA but not Programming Challenges. What chapter is that from? Okay, this is someone who's looking ahead. You're saying what? Chapter four. chapter four, looking very far ahead. Okay, so there's problems. So, so, so we'll deal with that. But that's an existence proof. 
supposedly, that there are problems that will work better on one judge than the other. Okay? I'm sorry that this is the case, but that's life. The fact that you've got two judges doubles your chances of getting it to work right. Okay? Now the other possibility, which I'd like to think is more likely in this case, is that you have a um, legitimate problem with your program. Okay? But let's go through the uh, problems. What I want to do now today is to go through the problems. Right now I have nothing planned to do today except to talk about what the problems are. Have us go through the problems, have us read them, let us think about how we would solve them and try to work out to the point where people can go and proceed on with it from here on. Any questions? Questions? Uh, how are programs getting input? Like, can do this about how to start? Okay, so how do you start? Okay, let's think about how we start. Um, are there other people who are confused about how we start? Okay, that's a fair question. Okay. How many people are not confused about how to start? Okay, how to submit programs. Okay, okay, let's, let's go back here again. So the question now is how do we submit programs? And my guess is the answer may depend a little bit judge to judge, but let's figure it out. First question is submit to the programming challenges judge. Someone who has done it successfully, how do you submit problems to the programming challenges judge? <laughs> Okay, so let's take a look at what we're going to do here. So here, I believe I have a window of what happens when I log into the uh, programming judge's classroom. Okay? Now you may get a different view because there's a different view between a faculty view and a student view. Just to show you what I get a view of, this is my class, HKUSD, Spring 2009. Okay? I have the following students as having been registered in my course, okay? Many of you have registered for the uh, programming challenges um, on the judge, but I'm guessing many of you, some of you have not registered for my course, okay? So there is a button you have to click from your interface to register for my course. Is this correct? <coughs> okay, from someone who's done it, what button do you have to push? One of these people. What button did you have to push to join my course? Okay. Join class, okay? So one of the first things you should do is join the class and then I can see what happened to these people. In my class, I have a set of problems that are um, assigned for the semester, okay? This is your semester's worth of work, these 56 problems, okay? I recommend doing them four weeks at a time Okay, meaning one week at a time. Some people here, someone claims to have done 17 problems. Okay, how did he do 17 problems between now and last class? The reason is because he had done them before, correct? Okay, he had played with these judges before and done these problems. Okay, so it's not that uh, I expect anyone to have done 17 problems since last class. Okay, what I'm hoping people will have done is start looking at the first four problems, okay? And for next week, I want to see some progress towards doing the first four problems for everybody. That's my goal in here, okay? Now, how do you submit? Let's look at what happens when we click 3n plus 1, okay? I believe this will get me to that problem, okay? Am I right about this? Or maybe I already did that one. No. No, no. Let's see what happened when I clicked on this. Sorry about this. Oh, 3n plus 1. You can see I get to find out who from my class has submitted. I find out how many times did you submit. This is the student, um, what I get to view. I get to monitor what you're doing. Okay? And this is good. Okay? Now, um, what I'm curious about, though, is from your point of view, what do you get access to? Does someone want to come up and log in as a student so we can sh show how they do it? Someone who has an account who's done this successfully. Can someone show, log in as a student? Does someone have a student account that they would be willing to come up and log in on? Okay. I haven't done it yet, but I'm 
You haven't joined the class. Someone who's joined the classroom. Who has joined the classroom? Okay, will you come up here and log in as a student? Okay. Let's come back. Let's say, let's open up another window. I want to try to make sure everybody sees what we're doing here. Programmingchallenges.com. Let's come back to here. Okay. Uh, this is, I guess, the wrong browser. Is that right? So let's get rid of this. Let's say new window. How do you get a new window from this? I don't use it. Okay. Now let's try to log on and see what happens. Okay, log out. That's fine. Log me out. Good. Everybody look at his password. <laughs> no, 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 that's not helpful. Okay. okay, don't bother. That's why you shouldn't bother to look at this stuff. Okay, good. Okay, so now we are here. This says this is what you solved so far, right? This is you. Okay, now how do you go and submit a problem? What do you have to do? You say submit. Let's go click on submit. Okay, now you have two different choices for how you should submit. First, you have to have logged on. Then you've got a choice. You have to give tell it what language you're using. Okay, um, you can either, I guess, paste the source code in or um, have it upload a file. For people who've done this, how many people pasted in their program? Okay, how many people submitted it, uploaded a file? Did anybody have any weird experiences in doing it this way? Okay, I would always think pasting it would probably be a little bit less reliable because somehow you might forget the semicolon at the end or something like that. Okay, but this is up to you. And then when you submit it, again, we don't have an example to run, but basically when you submit it, what happens? Solved or unsolved. It comes back solved or unsolved, okay? Yeah. And if it's unsolved, it tells you what? Wrong answer or presentation error or something like that. Okay? So this is how you would submit it in the uh, programming challenges, Judge. Any questions about that? Now do the same thing with the UVA judge. Submit? Who uses the quick submit? How do people get? Yeah, you use the quick submit? I found once. Did it work or not work? <coughs> it works. It works, okay. So that might be one. Now show me how you would go about doing So one possible is you go to quick submit, okay? And now you type in the problem ID. Now one thing that's important about the problem ID 100. If you look at the printed problem, the, the, the problem description in the book, Okay, this is actually one case where, again, having the book is probably useful, or references from the book are probably pretty useful. On the problem descriptions in the book, I list two ID numbers for each problem. One is the number ID number on the UVA judge, 
Okay, and what is the ID number on the programming challenges, Judge? Okay, here, this is except, this accepts the, the UVA numbers, but not the programming challenges numbers. Okay, so it's important you have the right number for each problem. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, for those of you who, yeah, question. It's not supposed to be downloadable. The publisher would be very unhappy if it was downloadable. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I don't know anything about, about the world. Okay? But, um, but what, is, what is downloadable from UVA is a printed page of each one of the problems. Okay? That does have both the numbers on it. Did anybody print the uh, problems from the programming challenge judge? Okay? Show me a printout from the programming challenge judge. Okay, here is a program print program from, from the program and challenge judge. Um, actually, it looks like this also only has the number from the um, from the UVA judge on it. How did you get the number for the program and for the UVA the, 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 the corresponding numbers? Okay, mm -hmm. what? And the part of contest. Yeah. Okay, look at contest. Okay. Program and challenges. Chapter one. Okay, so this is good. So when you go on on the, the the if you look from the programming challenges section of the UVA judge, here they have them under the programming challenges ID num the, the 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 UVA ID numbers. Okay, so here there is no problem then getting the number and submitting it. Right? What if we wanted to submit it this way instead of from quick submit? What do we have to do? Okay, submit. Okay. And now you have to tell it what language do you want. Okay, what compiler. And you can paste your code or upload it. Okay. Any questions? Back in the old days, you had to email the program to it. Okay, and this is probably a lot better. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. So I now claim that this is now a... This should be a relatively easy mechanical thing, right? Any questions about mechanics at this point? Okay. Were there any surprises about compilation? Like you submitted a program, it compiled on your local machine, and it didn't work when you got there? Or did everybody successfully compile programs? Okay. Wrong or right answers are a different question. Okay. Any questions? Uh, actually, UVA shows here how how UVA they they compile this. Okay. Uh, this is uh, options for G plus plus GNU C plus plus compiler. Okay. So this is this is worth knowing. So if you want to see why your thing isn't compiling, okay, this is probably a good thing to know because you should be able to use these compilers. Do, do, does the, do, do the GNU compile? Does everybody here have access to an account where there is a Unix like? GNU compiler available. Okay? Is there anybody who does not feel they have access to that? Okay? So I claim you shouldn't have compiler problems because you should be able to test your programs locally and then go and resubmit them. Any questions? You should only submit after you have gotten it working rather than test out their compiler by fixing your compiler bugs by repeatedly submitting it. Any questions? And how long does it take to get a response when you submit it? We don't have, unfortunately, a demo here. Uh, UVA is slower. How long does it take UVA to do? Uh, about 30 minutes. Uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds about to get an answer minute. back. Yeah. OK. And how long does programming challenges take to get an answer back? A few seconds. A few seconds. OK. So you'll figure out which one to use. You'll eventually get comfortable with doing both. Any questions? OK, thanks a lot. You want to log out here? It's up to you. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. Any questions now about the mechanics or the mechanics down? Okay. I want very much not to have problems with mechanics in the future. Okay. But if you have any issues coming back, like the judge doesn't work, it's I'm having trouble submitting this one. It's a good thing to raise the issue at the beginning of class, so that you can learn from the experiences of everybody else here. Any questions? 
Okay, let's look at the problems themselves now and um, see if we can, uh, you know, um, see, see, if, see if we can start, try to um, debug, you know, let's say understand them and debug them and get them working. First question was this problem 100, 3n plus 1. How many people tried to submit the 3n plus 1 problem? Raise your hands. Okay. How many of you how many of you succeeded? Raise your hands if you tried and got this problem accepted. How, raise your hands now if you tried this problem and failed. Okay, I hear one person that's failed. Let's go through the problem, okay, a little bit. Just to think a little bit about how you read one of these problems. Because I think that's part of part of learning this thing, is learning how do you read a problem. And one, I guess, disadvantage. Let me check one other thing though. This problem, this judge here is the, uh, what you call it, is the pro U UBA judge. Let's just see if we can get the write-up from the programming challenges judge. Okay. Oh, I guess this is, what is it? This is not working to me. Oh, this is still Firefox again, right? How do I get uh, how do I get the Microsoft Internet Explorer? Boom. Okay, let's see if this goes. Boom. Okay. Now can I look at problems yet or probably not? Looks like I don't seemingly can't, so I'm going to log on again. Um, Sorry about this. Okay, let's just see if we get the uh, problem. Test. Okay, so oh, okay. So as far as downloading the problems, does PS work here? Postscript doesn't work on. Uh, uh, okay, they don't have a Postscript viewer. They do have one. Open. I say open. Bingo. Okay, so this is very good. Let's look at this version of the problem now. Okay? Actually, let's look at this version and compare it to what you saw in the UVA version. This is actually one reason I want to talk to convince you that the book is a good thing. Here is the problem that they had. See how they have this algorithm? They tell you about NP and recursive and unsolvable. I have edited the problem here. So I think it is clearer. The description is clearer. Okay? I think the write-ups from the, the, the programming challenge judge are clearer. Okay, they're supposed to be compatible, but they try to avoid ambiguities and they try to get to the point, okay, in the appropriate way. Any questions? So I recommend you, you use the programming challenges problems now, write-ups, instead of the UVA write-ups. Okay, but what is this problem asking? Let's just make sure we understand how to read one of these things. There is a certain level of narrative telling you what the story is, and some of the story is interesting, Okay, hopefully. Um, it tells you about this conjecture that is true that that seemingly for every integer, if you do the 3n plus 1 process, where if it's odd, you multiply it by 3n, you multiply it by 3 and add 1. If it's even, you divide it by 2. Okay? Somehow it'll eventually slither down to 1. Okay? This is actually really an amazing thing. I want people to think about it. You know, there's a couple of ways you could think about it that it's obviously wrong. Okay? One is that if you take a look at, um, I mean, somehow, somehow it just doesn't sound quite right. If you take a number n and you multiply it by 3 and add 1, that makes it 3 times bigger, right? You take it n over 2, you, that makes it half as big, right? So if you keep doing, if, if numbers are equally likely to be even or odd, 
That means that half the time it should be multiplied by 3. And half the time it should be divided by 2. Right? So that would say that in general, if you think about this in a trivial way, it shouldn't for every integer. Why doesn't that keep growing? If, on, if, if half the integers are even, and half the integers are odd, and when it's even, you multiply it by three, you know, by three, and if it's odd, you divide it by two. Why isn't it that the integers, these numbers always grow bigger? Okay? Somehow it's got to get down to one in order to not get bigger. Why is that? Somehow the odds that, that we spend more time, we have to spend more time doing the even operations than the odd operations. That's got to be the only way around this, right? And it should be clear that that's the case. Because whenever you have an odd number, what happens when you have an odd number? What's the next number in the sequence? Okay, it's an even number. And then it immediately gets cut down, right? But it might get cut down again if it happens to still be an even number, right? So you're always dividing out all the power, all the uh, multiples of two before you go kick it up again. Any questions? Okay, so how do you read the problem? One is you tell the story, okay? Second, there is a careful input description, okay? And the input will consist of, okay, it says it will consist of pairs of integers, one pair per line. All integers will be less than a million and greater than zero. So one thing that's good is it's telling you something about what you can expect, okay? You know, sometimes you have to read these problems very, very carefully because unless they give you a specification of what, the, what, what is true, you can't make assumptions, okay? So for example, suppose they didn't tell you that the integer would be less than a million, okay? Is there any reason to believe the integer would fit into one integer length? Maybe they could have given you an integer of the form a million nines. Okay, and you might have to worry about dealing with high, very high precision integers. Okay? So you have to read these things very, very carefully. Okay? And it says now, given numbers i and j, you are to compute the maximum cycle length. I see, so what you do is you're given a pair of integers, i and j, and you want to, for every integer in the range between i and j, Test how many steps it will take to go down. And then, once you've figured that out, pick the biggest one and report that. Okay? Any questions about it? They give you a careful input description and an output description. Okay? And it says here, for each pair of integers, i and j, output i and j in the same order in which they appeared in the input. And then the ma maximum cycle length for integers between and including integers i and j. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? That's a seemingly complicated thing. What does that mean? Okay? Any questions? Okay, maybe, I, maybe we'll go keep, let's keep going on a little bit before we look at this. And finally, the problem statement will end with sample inputs and sample outputs, right? Now, these are very useful for debugging your program, okay? For any of you, when you ran your pro wrote this program, did you test it on all the sample inputs? Okay? It's important that you test it on all sample inputs to make sure that you have reason to believe that it's right, right? Usually, some of these are small enough that, it can, that you can do them by hand, okay, and help make sure you understand the problem better, okay? So, for example, it says here that from 1 to 10, it said that the largest integer had 20 steps. Which integer had 20 steps between 1 and 10? Did anybody work this example out by hand? Okay. This problem seems like it's a very simple problem, and maybe you didn't feel a need to, okay? But often to make sure you really understand what the written description is, it's good to sort of work some of these out by hand. Any questions? One final question is, did you type in the sample input, or did you get it from someplace? Okay? 
Obviously, you could type it in as a test case yourself. I believe that the judge makes available the sample input from these problems. Okay, is that right? Did anybody, is, is anybody here, is, is, is what I'm saying true? Does anybody know if the judge makes available in a, a machine readable format the sample input? Yeah? Did you find it? Okay, so one possibility might be you, you, you did something like this, right? You uh, took the, the HTML and cut and pasted. That would be one possibility. I believe the judge, the programming challenge judge, these days does actually, or is supposed to, try to make available the input for some of these problems. Let's just see if, we, if that's right. Does it say anything about where the input is? Um... That's not, okay, maybe I have to follow up about it. Clearly the easiest thing to do, I guess if it's separated like this, if you've got the HTML like this, what you're saying is you clipped it like this, right? Yeah. It's on the left side. The column, oh. files for the or you're saying even better, sample files for the problems, okay? This looks like a zip file that you download. And that will enable you to get the test case inputs for it. This might be a useful thing to do. Does everybody see that? Because some of the problems have very complicated input. Okay, and you want to make sure you have no problems clipping it or anything like that. Okay? So I will claim that for, for doing these problems, you don't need to, uh, you should certainly clip the input. You should certainly you know, either download the input this way or clip it. Um, and you should definitely compare to make sure that the answers you get are the same as the sample output here. Okay? Any questions? And when it's not, then you're wrong. Okay? Any questions? Now on this problem, the simple 3n plus 1 problem, how many people got it accepted the first time? You did. How many people did not get it accepted the first time? Okay, why not? Let's go and relive this experience. Why did you not get it accepted the first time? Okay, someone who wants to volunteer. Uh, because I, small I see. Is this what happened? Okay, so let's look at what problem <coughs> you're saying. You're saying that what test case did you fail on here? You would fail your program you said would fail on the case 1, uh, okay, 120, it would have been fine, right? But what about 20 comma 1, okay? It said it wanted the integers between this range, okay? Your initial version of running this program assumed that the first number was smaller than the second number in the range. Right? Where does that state? Where in this problem description does it say that the first number in the line is less than the second number on the line? Okay, it doesn't. And because it didn't say that, you're allowed, the, the, the judge is allowed to put these integers in whatever order they want. That probably is why your program isn't working. Is that why? Okay, so I want you to think, this is, this is meant to be a, a, a training example here. How you have to read the specifications very, very carefully. I actually tried to make it more clear when I wrote this thing. What was the input? Okay, this was the, uh, what did I say the input was? Okay, pairs of integers. It says somehow the output, output i and j in the order that they appear. That means that, that, that i and j have to be in the same original order they appear. And that the maximum cycle length is all integers between and including i and j. Okay? It doesn't necessarily say that i is less than j. Okay? Any questions? Still 
Wait, so you're saying that, uh, you're saying that, that if you, if you... I think it doesn't have the case that I stumbled in J. Okay, how many people stumbled across the case where I was larger than J? Okay, you're saying that, that, that until you fixed that, your program didn't work, right? Okay. From my best recollections about this problem, they check this case. Okay? In general, I try to argue them to avoid these got you cases. But the ACM programming judge people seem to be very concerned that people read specifications very carefully. And they do add these gotcha cases sometimes. Okay? So all I'm saying, the main reason I want this problem here is a demo. Is a demo of why it's a gotcha, that there are gotcha cases. And otherwise, it's a very simple problem. Any issues with how you would program this problem? Okay. So I think the 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 the, the, the four the, the one hundred the three n plus one problem is pretty easy. Correct. Any questions about that? I don't think we need to talk about that some more. Let's look at a more interesting problems, however. Actually, what did I just do? Did I just get out of the wrong what I didn't want to get out of? Probably. Let's go back. Okay, let's look now at the, uh, what's the next problem I asked for? Minesweeper. What does the Minesweeper problem ask? Somebody who's done it. Okay, what is the problem here? Okay, it basically says that you're given his input. Actually, this is a, uh, okay, right. It says that you're given his input. A, um, the way I read it, it tells you a little bit about a story. It gives you a demo. It says basically, what does it say the input is? The input will consist of an uh, arbitrary number of arrays. Each line will contain two integers, m and n, and it tells you how big they can be. Okay? It says m and n are between 0 and 100. Okay? Which stands for the number of lines and columns in the field. The next n lines have m characters to represent it. Okay? Say squares are dashes, okay, and a mine is represented by a star. They give you some kind of a mechanism to terminate input. Again, one thing that you'll find is that some of the problems use different mechanisms for terminating input. Here it says an array where m and n is zero is the end. Sometimes they will start at the beginning by saying there will be five cases, okay, and you'll have to loop through it. And sometimes they'll want you, I guess, to just detect end of file. Okay? So you'll eventually have to get that kind of thing in. For each field, you've got to print the following message on a line alone. Okay? Field x colon. Okay? Where x is the number of fields starting. The next n lines contain this thing. And there must be an empty line between fields. Okay? Here's a sample input. And here's a sample output. Okay? Any questions about it? Now you had trouble getting this one to work, right? You're always getting a presentation error. Why might you be getting a presentation error? Okay? Let's think about it. Any ideas why someone might get a presentation error on a problem like this? One possibility might be if you have an extra blank line at the end of the paper. Okay? So let's take a look at this thing. What does it say about the formatting? Okay. It tells us that there is a, a, a message on a line alone. And then the next n lines contain this thing. So if you have a blank line in the wrong place, that would be a possibility for failing the input. Does everybody agree with that? It might be that if you add an extra blank line at the end, Perhaps if you go and do it and say, print the field and then the next blank line for the input, and then go and read it and see there's no more, that would be a condition when you might get a presentation error. What other invisible conditions might you get a presentation error from? Okay. What if you put, let's say, an extra blank at the end of each character line? That might very well be enough to trigger a presentation error. Okay? Any other ideas on how what might someone might do to get a presentation error? 
I guess if you typed in it used instead of a zero, you printed out an O. But that might be a, you know, that would be a really dumb mistake, right? Making sure that you don't have any extra blanks here. Those are kind of the important things to look at. Did anybody else have trouble with presentation errors here? How many people, how, how many people successfully got this problem? Raise your hands if you did. How many people tried and didn't get it working? Just you, okay. How many people had any other intermediate problems with this? Okay. Again, that's fine. Okay, any questions? One question I would like to raise, though, here, as a programming style. Actually, now that we have, this problem is the first, let's say, vaguely non-trivial one we had. How many lines of code are people's programs? Does anybody remember or can guess how long your program is for this? Okay, does anybody want to volunteer how long their program is on Minesweeper? Yeah? 40 lines. Somebody else want to say, was it they have more than 40 lines, less than 40 lines? Less? How long was yours? Okay, oh, well, okay. See, there's less lines, but enough to take more than a few seconds to count. Okay? Any other people have lines? Program for, who had, whose program would they think was longer than 40 lines? 67 lines. Whose program was less than 40 lines? Okay. What makes a difference here? Let's think a little bit about how we would do a simple problem like this. Because again, your goal in this world is to try to get as these programs, how many lines long? He had 24 lines long. Okay. Now let's look into this and see, and, this, and your program was accepted, right? So it's a perfectly fine program. What language did you use? C++. And you used? C++, okay. So let's look at the difference and think a little bit about how you would solve this kind of a problem as easily as possible. Here we're getting points for easily as possible. First thing I'd like to ask is, how long, what size array, what data structure did you use to represent the board? Someone want to volunteer. What data structure should be used for the board in this problem? You say 2D array. Okay, a 2D array of what? Okay, let's think of it. You're using a 2D array of characters. Okay? Now, one question should be, is it, should it be a 2D array of characters or integers? Or both? You keep both a 2D array of characters and a 2D array of integers. Okay? Do you keep both of them? He's only keeping a character array, okay? So now how are you doing that? So, so let's think what you, okay, so you're saying there's a question here. We agree it's got to be a, a 2D array is the right data structure. There's some debate as to whether you need two of them. There's some debate about whether it should be character or integer, okay? My other question is how big is it? What were the bounds on your arrays? What? Okay, let's say, what, yours was what? Two times n. Two times column. You said two times the number of columns. Wait, no, 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 no. Just keep two lines, okay? Oh, okay, what you're saying here is, if I understand what you're saying is, you are keeping as input two, lo two rows. Two rows, yeah. Two rows of data at a time. And you're going to read the um, the value the, the ma matrix here, okay? Read two lines of it, okay? And then um, once you've read those two lines, what you're going to do is um, compute the integers for which the top line or the bottom line, or what are you going to do? Okay, 
So there's no reason why, this seems like it wouldn't work if you just had two lines at a time. That's my first observation. But how big was your array then? Okay? You used a 100 by 100 array. And why was it 100 by 100? Okay? Is that large enough? Okay? Who else did not use a 100 by 100 array? How big was your array? I think we can the Okay, so one thing is, you said you use dynamic arrays, okay? Okay, so the way I look at this tells me, this tells me that the size of the array, m and n, can be any integer greater than zero and less than or equal to 100. Is that right? So, I, so by my measure here, a 100 by 100 array should suffice, okay? You use the dynamic array for it. Um, I guess that's probably, is it more complicated to use a dynamic array? Mm -hmm. Just add two lines or create the array and delete it. Okay. Did anybody, yeah, what right, you? I think So, okay, so I would think, first of all, let's think about what, what matters and what doesn't matter in this context. First of all, speed of dynamic arrays versus non-dynamic arrays is probably not an issue, okay? Because both of these are trivially fast, okay, to do. Your computers are fast. This is not one where the algorithmic complexity is complicated, okay? I would probably use a static array, and all the problems probably are the input is specified so you can use a static array. So unless there is a good reason, I would probably use a static array for these, okay? But I would probably not, if I were doing this problem, I would not use a 100 by 100 array, okay? Why not? What? You want to use 3 by 100? Yeah. I would absolutely definitely not use a 3 by 100 array. Okay? Because it's too complicated. The goal in these problems is to try to get them done as easily as possible. The 24 line solution is more interesting to me in this context than the one that will run a few milliseconds faster. Why? Or use a little bit less memory. Why? You are given clearly enough memory to solve the problem. Memory is not the limitation. In a problem like this, it's clear that algorithmically there is nothing complicated, okay? It's going to be linear in size regardless of what you do. No matter how stupid you are, you won't be able to find a way to make this nonlinear, okay? So speed is not going to be an issue here. The issue is to get it done correctly using as little, as easily as possible, okay? Any questions about that? Does everybody agree that that's kind of the metric that we're looking for on a problem like this? Any questions? Now, did anybody else do this and not use a 100 by 100 matrix? Okay. Yeah? I use one hundred and two. Okay, you did 102 by 102. Why was that the case? Now, very interesting here. What did he do? He said, I am going to use a much bigger, a bigger array. 102 by 102 array, right? And what he did was he put the input in starting at position, I guess he probably had it starting from position 00, zero and he had it going up to position 101, 101. Okay? He initialized everything to be zeros, right? He then, when he read in these numbers, okay, what he did is, why did he do it this way? 
Okay, what did he gain by making the array 102 by 102 instead of 100 by 100? He did not have to worry about the special case of outside the boundary. Okay? Then suddenly what he did is he initialized everything to be zero. He probably added, um, and, and then now for every case, what did he do for each cell? He probably put in the matrix, okay? A, um, what you call it? A one, wherever there was a bomb. Is that basically right? Okay, you mean the input starting at 1, 1 was the first cell here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what you did is you had this thing, you initialized it to 0. And you put a 1 wherever there was a bomb. Is that right? And now what the problem reduced to from each cell was 4i goes from 1 to 3, 4j goes from 1 to 3. Okay. Add up these numbers. Okay except perhaps the number 2-2, two, two. okay? And that gave you the question of how many bombs there were around this neighborhood. Did everybody see that? The thing he gained from this is he didn't have to worry about special cases. He traded off a little extra memory and made his code much simpler because of that. Does everybody see that? There is something to learn from this, okay? Even this, this is a trivial problem. Okay? But the reason his code was 24 lines and everybody else's code was 26 low, it was 640 lines, 60 lines, is because they didn't handle the special cases in the simplest manner. Any questions about that? Okay? This is a technique called programming with sentinels. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this before. Okay? What is a sentinel in a data structure? Okay? Has anybody ever heard of it? Yeah. It's like an extra little thing you add on the end to make something simpler, but it's not really necessary. Yeah, so like one idea would be, um, suppose let's say you wanted to write an insertion sort. Does anybody remember what insertion sort is? It's one of these things where you take a number, let's say this number is 5, 7, you know, you have an assorted part of an array, and then you add another element to it, right? and you swap it forward until it uh, goes into the right spot, right? So if the number was, was 8, you would go bunk, 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 and then insert the 8th element here and move everybody else back. Does everybody see that? Now what would you do though if the element you were inserting was 1? That was an example that the place where you had to insert it you had to check to make sure that you didn't run off the end of the array when you were looking for the first element smaller than it. Does everybody agree with that? If, on the other hand, you added to your array minus infinity as the first element of the array, that data value is such that you never need to have the loop test. Am I out of the index of the array because you will never crash off the end? Do people see what I mean? How many people see what I mean by this? How many people don't see what I mean by this? Okay, I didn't get any responses from anybody. This is a bad sign. How many people see what I mean by this? Okay? How many people don't see what I mean by this? Okay? Any questions? Okay? Any other, let's say, subtleties about a problem like this, which isn't very subtle? Okay? Okay? Any other questions? Okay, so I don't see any reason why people can't get this one working. Does everybody agree with that? What other problems next? What's the next problem that we had to deal with in here? Which, the trip. Okay, let's read about the trip. This is now the first one where I think there maybe is a little bit of algorithmic subtlety here. What is the problem? The problem is we are given as input let me go get this. So the problem is we are given as input um, a collection of values that people um, 
of the amounts of money people have paid. And we want to move the money around, okay, so that everybody has paid the equal amount, okay, or as equal as possible, given the fact that you can't divide things finer than a penny, okay, such that everybody is equal, but the money is, but as little money as possible moved around. Any questions? Let's look at the examples here and see if this problem is trivial. Okay? If this per the people A, B, and C paid $10, $20, and $30, how do we, um, what do you call it, make everybody equal using as little money moving around as possible? What? How do we make it equal? What is the actual way the money moves? So you're saying that if I moved uh, ten dollars, if I if I paid an extra ten dollars here from this guy, if I moved ten dollars from here to here, okay? Or I guess it's a question of expense. It's a question of am I moving money or am I moving expenses? And maybe it's an equal way to think about it. You're saying that the way to equalize it is to move ten dollars from here to here. Is that what you're saying? Okay, and then it's going to be 20, 20, 20. And that is, if you look at the output, the right answer. Am I right? What about this case? They give you another test case. Here you've got four people. Okay, 15, 1501, 3, 301. How do we move the money around in this case to make it as even as possible? Does anyone want to make a proposal? Or, or, you know, just make a proposal. It doesn't have to be right, but I'm, I'd like to hear a proposal. Okay? Maybe we need some notation. Let's, let's maybe go back and try it again. Here it would be the numbers are what? If people are A, B, C, and D, the numbers here are 15, okay, 0, 0, 15, 0, 1, Three and three oh one. How do we move the money, okay, to make it equal? What would someone suggest? Okay. Any ideas? Well, now, what about this example? How does the money move around? So as little money moves around as possible, what do, what do you say? Who should give money to, who should give what money to who? A gives C $6. You're saying A gives C $6. Okay, so, so A gives us $6, you're saying. And then that's going to now leave us with what? Nine? Nine. And uh, now we've got 1501 and 301. B gives the $5.99. B gives C 5.99. B gives D $5.99, right? Well, and how much how much should B give D? No, A gives D So what are you suggesting here? Let's look this example out. Who gives what who, who gives what to who? Uh, well, let's first finish working out that example, because that example you're saying may be wrong. If I give it like this, that will cause the movement of $9. Does everybody agree? Now, if we want to make money move from here to here, how much money has to, wait a minute, $6 moved, excuse me. Another possibility is we now move $6 more from here. And then everybody would have how much? This guy would have 9. This guy would have 9.01. This guy would have 9. This guy would have 9.01. Clearly, this is an acceptable outcome. 
Everybody is equally uniform. Does everybody agree with that? But you're telling me this is not the way to do it while moving the minimum amount of money. Right? What was the way to do it with moving around the minimum amount of money? You said that A was supposed to give his money to who? If A gives the money to D, how much money should A give to D? $5 and how much? 99 And how much should... It looks like B's also going to have to give something to D, C, right? How much should B give C? Six. Okay? And if this works out now, how much money is there? Clearly less money has moved around. Only 11.99 instead of 12, right? And what are the totals now? This guy has 15.01. This guy now has, this guy has, uh, excuse me, 9.01. The next guy has how much? 9.01. This guy has 9, and this guy has 9. Does everybody see that? So this is also a satisfying outcome, except this is the desired one, because the total amount of money moved is $11.99. Does everybody see that? Okay? What the problem is? Okay? So what is the algorithm here? Does everybody see that's what the issue is? And working this out, we would see that the naive program for solving this might not work. Okay? Any questions? So how do we figure out who gets what money? Does anyone want to propose an algorithm? Yes? I thought those numbers first. What? I use insertion to sort those numbers first. You're going to sort, you're going to say sort the amount of money people are owed, have, or owed, right? Okay, so it's now 1501, 1500. 301 and 3. Um, by, uh, when I saw the average, I can see the total amount of money. And I calculate the average. You calculate the average amount of money. Um, I, also, I start them all by integer. Okay. So I have the integer. So I use the integer division to get the average. Then I have some changes. Okay. So what you're saying is that the key issue here is that there is a mean amount of money, uh, some mu, a mean amount of money, which in this case is going to be 9, <coughs> right? Yeah. And there is also a change, okay? Which is how much cents are left over when we make sure everybody gets the minimum mean. And in this case, that's going to be 2, right? Yeah. And now what do you do? Okay, so what is the algorithm here? I think what your argument here is that two people are going to end up with extra money, right? Which two people should end up with extra money? The ones that have the most money, right? If you want to make everybody as even as possible without the extra money moving around, right? It seems to me that what you want to do is you're right. You want to transfer the money so that who are the people who should get the smallest amount, the uh, bigger amount of money? It would seem to me the people that have the bigger amount of money to start with, right? And that seems like a necessary condition to, to move it around, okay? Any questions? Does that completely solve our problem? I'm not sure it does, actually. Okay? So what did you get? Yeah, I, I, I solved the question by considering two cases. One, one is take the money, or another one is give the money. Right? Right. Um, and I calculate the average uh, the money for upper bound and lower bound, because the average may be uh, 10.005, so we should consider, we should use 10.001 or 10.00, yeah, 
So when compared to case, uh, we get larger because we must, um, how is it, um, we must, um, uh, yeah, get the larger one and the, the answer is, yeah. Okay, yeah, the answer is, yeah. <laughs> okay, good, okay. Uh, let's think about this. I don't know if we've beaten this to death yet, but uh, let's keep going on. So it seems like what the idea here is, is maybe the way to think about it is everybody has a certain amount of money that is needed now, right? You're figuring out how much money everyone should have at the end. That was what you were doing here with this, right? You were really deciding that this person should be have 9.01 and this person should have 9.0 and this should have 9. So you know the final configuration. Now my question is, is there anything that's interesting about how you achieve it? How do you go from this to figure out how much money is needed? Uh, and all those difference, absolute value of those difference. Or up, like all up, so I have twice the chain. I see, so what you want to say is that we, we find the absolute value of the change. This was a change of six, this was a change of six, this was a change of six. This was a change of six. No, it's wrong. Okay, I did the math wrong. Right? This was a change of 5.9. This was a change of 5.99. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And you add them all up. Okay? And you added up the absolute values. These were the absolute values, right? And? And you then divide that by two, okay? Because that's interesting, because money is flowing from one guy to another, okay? You're saying that the difference here reflects people giving, some people giving and some people getting. That's why you're dividing by two, right? So what's nice about this approach? I like this algorithm, okay? What's interesting about it is he has completely sidestepped the question of who is giving the money to who. Does everybody see that? Okay. So this, I kind of like this. This is kind of an elegant solution that gives the answer that we want without actually doing something that seems more complicated, which is figuring out who's paying who. Okay. Any questions about that? This is, I think, the answer I like. This sounds very simple to program, right? Did you get this one going? Yeah. How many lines of code was it? 42 or 43. Okay. Anybody else get it going? Um, How many lines of code? I, I, I try this algorithm, but I, I have some problems uh, with uh, converting doubles to integer. Yeah. That's an interesting mistake because 15 over 1 and you multiply it by 100. The output will be 1,500 But if you try to convert it to integer, it will give you 1,000. Okay, so one question that you're saying is, but gee, you're having trouble with numerical precision. One idea is to notice that money comes in a quanta. He had a good idea here. Why were you dealing with floating point numbers? Floating point numbers are a bad thing. Okay? Why are floating points numbers a bad thing? Because a floating point number is never equal to zero. Or if you can't trust it to be equal to zero. Okay? How might we have solved this problem? What if instead, okay, we read these things in and immediately converted them to pennies? Okay? That would be one argument that we were doing here, right? So, so the way you're doing it, you're saying, was you converted it to integers immediately. Is that right? So you read it in as what? You read integer dot integer. Is that what you did? Okay. And then now you had in dollars and pennies, and then you converted it into a single integer of pennies. Okay. And you then did everything in penny space, basically. Right? And then when you printed it out, you did the same conversion. You took the pennies, div, a uh, hundred and the pennies mod one hundred. Is that right? Okay. Which is a better way to do it? 
Okay, these are now coding issues more than deep algorithmic issues. But let's think about what the tricks involved are. Which is a better way to do it? How many lines of code was yours? 67. 60, 62. 62, okay. So let's think how we might have done this, okay? First question is, was there, how did you go about that I think most people would have trouble with? How did you do your input statement so as to read this as integer dot integer? What was your reading method? How did you input the integer? Scanf. Scanf. And what was your scanf statement? A percentage D. Percentage D dot. Percentage D. Percentage D. Okay. And so it's smart enough then, is this right? So one interesting thing is if you did your scan F like that, okay? This is not obvious to me, but now, it's, now it seems to make sense. The interesting thing is by using scan F in this way, he was able to actually read it as two integers without any really any more complexity than, read, than, than it would be to read it as a real. Does everybody see that? Question. Excuse me, what? Okay, you see in integer and character and integer too. Okay, the other thing you're saying is you could have done it as being percent D, percent C. No, no, C in. C in, okay, you're using C in. C in integer and character. Okay, so the interesting thing is, so depending upon people's reaction, there is nothing weird about parsing this as two integers. This was not done in a complicated way. That's the important thing to see here. So you could have done it his way without that complicated a parsing thing. Does everybody agree with that? Now the bigger question is are we better off dealing with this as floating point or real? Okay. Why did we have any floating point troubles here doing this though? It still seems to me that if I had the difference between this. Okay, what's another way that we could have done it? Suppose we did this as reals. We read them as reals. And we did them as reals, okay? Would there have been a problem? Did anybody do this purely as reals, okay? Did you have any troubles or anything subtle that you had to do because you were dealing with reals? Just multiply, one hundred. The problem is when you multiply by one hundred, you will not get the right answer. Wait a second, let's slow down for a second. So what you did here, well, using this method, what would we have done? Wait, say this again, what was your problem when you did it in reals? Uh, uh, if you input uh, the whole, yeah. um, the whole, uh, if you're in volume, it's all one, and you multiply by 100 and make it change to the integer. And the last part of the integer. Okay, but the question now, why did you ever convert it to integers? Let's think about it. You never converted it back to integers, did you? Uh, just calculate the floor and the ceiling for the average. Okay. So one possibility would have been to, to, to avoid, let's say, the numerical problems. You say would be using floor and ceiling. Only the average case, uh, only one is that. Use the double and the other use real. Use integer, yeah. Okay. So what would I have done now? Let's think about what I would have done. Okay, maybe, just sitting here trying to think about it. I might have done it by, and then you set up, an, you, you read in the array of integer values, right? You compute the mean, okay? And um, what everybody, and, and so, so I would read them in, I would sort them. That much I agree with, right? How did you sort them? What sorting algorithm did you use? Did you implement, you implemented insertion sort, right? How many lines of code did that take? Four or five lines. Did anybody else have a sort in their program? Use the sorting library. That's another idea here. You have access to sorting libraries, right? We'll talk more about that when we get to the section on sorting. But I would cringe at the idea of re-implementing of re sorting, okay? Because that's more work, and there's a good chance you could get that wrong. Okay? Any questions about that? Any questions about any of this? Okay. How many people have tried the last problem? The, uh, the um, uh, interpreter. You tried it. Anybody else? 
How did that, did people get it working or have problems? Problems. Working. You had a problem with a meaningless instruction. Okay, I don't know about the specifics of this one. Let's just take a quick look at this. Where does it say that? The interpreter. Okay, I know you guys have to run, and I don't want to keep you here too long. Are there any interesting issues here we need to talk about quickly? Okay. Anybody who did the problem? Anything curious that you want to talk about? Yes. I'm not sure about the Oh, so what you're saying is you have a problem because there's some issues about how the initialization works. Okay? You're concerned about whether or not every time you run it, this is one program, right? And should you initialize it between each case? Is that what you're saying? What do people say? Do you reinitialize the memory every time you run it? I would think the answer to that is yes. Okay, is that specified anywhere? Okay. The point is that at every point there's intermediate contents are empty. Okay, any questions? Okay, so go ahead. If you haven't gotten these working, go beat on it. Question, yes. What was it? The one under I haven't talked about that yet. Once you once I know you guys know how to read these problems, in about a month from now I will assign that as an assignment. Okay, any questions? Okay, thanks for your attention. Beat through these. The problems will hopefully get algorithmically more interesting later on. But it's important we get the mechanics of how you do them right now. Thanks for your attention. See you guys next class.